So we are starting strong with um, Dr. Lucas de Toca. He's uh, presenting online. So he is the first assistant secretary, um, works in the implementation and primary care response of the National COVID Vaccine uh, Task Force. And he's also the honorary senior fellow at the University of Melbourne. He's also a member of SRAP. So uh, hello, Lucas, please, are you there? Yes. Uh, Thank you very much um, for attending. I cannot see you, but yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much for being with us. Cool. Um, can you see the presentation? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Oh, sweet. Um, thank you. I'm calling from Ngunawal country or Ngunawal Daura uh, here in Canberra. So I, I extend uh, uh, acknowledging the traditional owners here as well as um, on the lands where, you're, where you are and, and or anyone else who's online. Um, thank you for having me and, and apologize. Uh, I wanted to apologize for not being there in person. I would have loved to be able to be there and meet uh, a, a lot of you. I've, I've, I've only joined SRAP uh, recently and I've um, up until now, in the last eight years that I've been in Australia, I feel I've been a bit disconnected from the Spanish community, and, and it's been amazing how welcoming Carmen and, and the rest of SRAP have been. Um, so hopefully we, uh, we we get to hang out in person soon. Um, but unfortunately, uh, with the vaccine program continuing full steam and some of our responsibilities managing or helping manage uh, the outbreak currently underway in the Northern Territory in remote Aboriginal communities, it was uh, impossible to uh, get out to Sydney today. Um, but um, so I'm conscious of time. I'll, I'll, we thought today we would just give, uh, just give a very quick overview of the aspects of the Australian government response to COVID-19 um, that I've helped um, uh, manage or lead or implement. Um, which, which from um, from our perspective, it's uh, it's uh, it, it's it's quite encouraging to see that uh, the government has been so open to have um, Spanish migrant um, helping with uh, with their response to the pandemic. Um, so uh, my, my involvement in the COVID response started in March last year, where we started to implement the health system response to, to the pandemic. Everyone um, has suffered uh, the pandemic over the last 20 months, so I don't need to give an overview of, um, of uh, uh, what happened or how, how we got there. But um, um, in addition to the sort of significant public health and social measures that the Australian government implemented very early on, on the advice of the then chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Brendan Murphy, who was my boss at the time, um, like closing the borders initially to China and then more broadly um, that only very recently have been uh, reopened in a partial way and from, uh, from December in a much broader way, which is exciting to see. Um, the Department of Health need to, needed to look at what we needed to do from a health system perspective to uh, be prepared to respond to the pandemic. Um, a key difference uh, between um, Australia and, and Spain, among many, of course, is uh, uh, um, uh, our absence of a uh, nationally single payer, um, sort of institutionally owned uh, public general practice or primary care system. Um, so, for, so in terms of pandemic preparedness and response, um, we needed to navigate the complexity of uh, GPs or primary care providers in Australia being um, over 8,000 uh, individual business owners or corporate entities um, that then had to be um, um, enlisted is a bad word, but um, um, gently uh, incentivized uh, to participate in, in pandemic activities as opposed to Spain where the um, uh, network of primary care uh, centres under the SNS um, um, can just be redeployed or repurposed for uh, pandemic activities as the uh, consejerías uh, require. Um, so from a, a health system preparedness and primary care response, the elements that we needed to focus on is ensuring that we could maintain access to regular primary care provision uh, without collapsing hospital services that needed to be preserved for COVID care. And this is early in very early March, about the 5th of March, when we still hadn't had a significant wave and we weren't sure whether we were a uh, suppression strategy was going to be successful or so bending the curve, preventing uh, rapid acceleration of cases and working on health, health system capacity uh, was the major strategy. Um, so we very early on from um, the 11th of March introduced telehealth um, broadly uh, across the primary care system to try to minimize face-to-face -face contact um, and use the national coronavirus, uh, the national triage hotline as a revamped national coronavirus helpline um, to help triage uh, questions and cases and direct people to the, to, to the right avenues. Um, in addition to 
transition to telehealth so that uh, people could receive care without having to potentially be, be at risk of exposure um, in face-to-face care. Uh, we stood up 150 general uh, practitioner-led respiratory clinics. So um, the package was designed from the 5th to the 11th of March, announced by the Prime Minister on the 11th of March, and on the 21st of March, we had the first three, the first one in uh, Makora Park in Sydney, um, opening up as a, um, as a G- GP-led respiratory clinic. So there was a supported centre um, with an adequate pr- uh, provision of personal protective equipment and infection and prevention and control measures uh, where people could present, receive face-to-face assessments for their respiratory symptoms and have a COVID test is required. And that was distinct to the sort of swab and go uh, testing centres that the states and territories were providing. Um, the complexity of the interplay between the federal health department and the states and territories and their different competencies in terms of provision of healthcare in Australia are uh, no different in complexity and headaches as the uh, issues with the Consejo Interterritorial and the uh, relations between Ministerio y Consejerías in Spain. Um, we also provided a free online infection prevention and control education and support, um, um, about 10 million people. 10 million uh, completions were, were done for those modules. And um, um, we developed about eight modules specifically for aged care workers and, and visitors and, and carers, um, and also specific modules for in Aboriginal Torres Strait communities. Um, we introduced um, uh, e-prescribing and home medicine support so that people could stay at home and receive their uh, medications directly and not having to go to the community pharmacy in person, thus reducing the exposure, the exposure risk. Um, and um, also we had some number of support, targeted support for uh, general practices with incentives if they were staying open for face-to-face care and also direct um, um, funding and work with Aboriginal community control health organisations. Um, and uh, um, that was the bulk of the work last, last year and broadly health system capacity was preserved. Um, there was, uh, of course, we had a critical point during the resurgence, but otherwise... Um, um, a, a pandemic experience throughout 2020, as you know, was much milder than in other, than in other parts of the world. And from late last year, we shifted from uh, and pivoted from um, um, focusing on the response and then transition to running the rollout. And, and um, I was put in charge of rolling out vaccines through the primary care system. Um, so uh, the complexity of, again, cajoling a, a system of independent owners um, on a public health um, activity was even more complex when we had to then provide um, access to novel therapeutics, novel vaccines to um, over 5,000 GPs, over 3,000 pharmacies, 150 Aboriginal community control health services and Commonwealth vaccination clinics. So, um, I mean, if, if you've been in Australia the last few months, you've probably seen the headline after headline after headline of botched um, uh, rollout and deliveries means, but ultimately... Um, in four weeks, we rolled out uh, access to AstraZeneca across 5,000 uh, general practices, then 3,500 pharmacies joined in. Uh, we had the challenges and the constant pivot from um, changing advice from the experts and when the uh, safety signal for AstraZeneca was discovered with the thrombosis the thrombocytopenia syndrome, we had to rapidly pivot to acknowledge that the main vaccine that we were using to primary care uh, wasn't the preferred vaccine for people under 50. Um, so the moment Pfizer change uh, or submitted for regulatory change and confirmed that they could we could maintain the vaccine um, in regular fridges for 31 days as opposed to the five days that were originally approved. We started to introduce Pfizer through uh, primary care, um, about 2,000 practices uh, throughout June, July, and then full rollout in September. Um, and then from September, we also in- introduced um, um, fi- um, Moderna uh, through community pharmacy. Um, so I think that that added in a very charged environment with um, with a lot of um, uh, press and political scrutiny, of course, um, to to complexities in the rollout. But ultimately, um, um, let's keep this in the interest of time. Ultimately, we ended up with a system in which there's over nine thousand uh, primary care points of presence um, all across Australia. The rollout was slightly staggered towards uh, regional and, and rural areas, and, and in fact, um, uh, nationally. Um, vaccine uptake rates, both for first dose and second dose, are slightly higher, not statistically significant, but slightly higher in regional and rural compared to metro, which is which is really good given the complexity of service delivery in Australia. Remote is lagging a little bit, but we've had our focus activity through the Royal Flying Doctor Service and others, and the Royal Flying Doctor Service has delivered about 62,000 vaccines. And now we have this network of uh, that is continually growing of 9,300 uh, pharmacies, GPs, and commonwealth vaccination clinics, in addition to state 
and territory, most vaccination clinics providing access to all three vaccines now, because now every GP, every pharmacy, every Aboriginal health service can order um, any of the three vaccines that we've got currently available in Australia. Um, as part of the rollout, uh, it was identified very early on um, that um, based on international experience that we needed to make sure that First Nations people uh, were appropriately um, uh, prioritised and protected in the, in the rollout. There's a 2.3 times higher burden of disease in Indigenous Australians compared to other Australians. And uh, the 2009 flu pandemic um, showed a significant vulnerability in Aboriginal communities, especially remote ones. So from the beginning, on the 5th of March, we established uh, an Aboriginal Josh Islander advisory group for COVID-19 uh, that guided every aspect of the response and was co-chaired by the Department of Health and the big body of um, Aboriginal health services. Um, so it was that principle of shared decision making and Aboriginal voices essentially leading the response directly into the national cabinet. Um, and that um, provided um, some successes with uh, essentially last year, uh, First Nations communities being virtually unaffected by um, uh, the infection itself through a lot of work, um, including uh, on their part, including using extraordinary powers under the Biosecurity Act to close off access to remote communities that essentially uh, close off 25% of the Australian landmass for access um, so that remote communities were protected from importation of the disease. It did result in a rate of COVID-19 in Aboriginal Australians um, in 2020 that was six times lower than general population, which is really good to see. Um, but unfortunately, that has now changed with the Delta outbreaks taking hold in New South Wales, Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory primarily uh, having a disproportionate impact in uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, population. So at the moment, about four percent of all cases are in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, whereas only about three to three and a half percent of the population are uh, First Nations. So it's now impacting Aboriginal people more so, which is not surprising, and it sort of follows what we see that um, um, COVID is becoming a disease of a the unvaccinated and b. Uh, communities that are in socio-economically disadvantaged uh, circumstances, as with many communities. I, I, did, I do challenge their um, well-intentioned but slightly misleading comments around how COVID doesn't discriminate. Most diseases do, um, and focus in, in, in areas of particular socio-economic, uh, socioeconomically vulnerable uh, circumstances. But um, overall, the, the, the partnership in the Aboriginal response um, has uh, allowed us to uh, adapt very quickly to changes. The AstraZeneca uh, safety signal had a disproportionate impact in Aboriginal people because 80% of the population is under 50. So we had to rapidly pivot to uh, offer Pfizer through Aboriginal health services. And while we currently have an unfortunate gap in uh, first dose coverage between uh, Aboriginal and other Australians, um, it is shrinking uh, week by week. And, and when we are seeing rates uh, grow quite rapidly at the moment, Australia is now in a, a strong position um, with um, um, over 90% of the population. 16 years and over having received at least one dose and, um, sorry, the hormone is a bit funny, um, and uh, um, just about 85% of their population, 16 years and over, having received, uh, having been fully vaccinated. Um, people at work, including Lieutenant General Fruin, who runs Operation COVID Shield, who's now in charge of the vaccine rollout, and Brenda Murphy from the Department of Health, joke that uh, their goal is to surpass uh, Spain's um, whole of population coverage, just to annoy me. Um, but um, but it's actually a really good goal because um, Spain's uh, stats at the moment are impressive. Um, and uh, when we look at whole of population, it's going to be hard to beat because um, Australia's population is slightly younger than, than Spain's. Um, so, of course, 12 plus coverage in Spain is a bigger chunk of the population than 12 plus coverage here. Uh, but we're confident that uh, Australia is very pro-vaccine. And even though we are seeing a lot of um, highly strident anti-vax messaging, the reality is that um, vac the vaccine hesitant segment it hovers and around two to three and a half percent um, of the population. And we are seeing really good uptake, including nearly hundred percent of all aged care workers. Um, and, um, and I think today we will cross 39 million doses being administered. Uh, we're now in a different phase. We've uh, opened a whole of population booster program, which is a bit ahead of other countries. I think Israel and a few others uh, have moved that way. The US is just moving that way. Um, so anyone 18 years and over uh, who had a COVID-19 vaccine uh, second dose six months or more uh, ago is strongly encouraged to get a, a booster um, from any of the primary care sites. And at the moment, uh, Pfizer is the preferred vaccine for boosters, but that will change hopefully soon. And the regulator is looking at Moderna for boosters um, at the moment. And the majority of doses have been administered by uh, the primary care system um, in Australia, which is really good to see because it, it builds on that patient-doctor 
relationship that provides um, a degree of certainty to the patient and answers questions when there they are concerns about adverse events. Um, so that's a very quick uh, overview, oh, yeah, of course. And then the next step, um, hopefully in a few weeks, we will hear from the regulator and from the medical experts about um, um, the rollout in the 5 to 11 year old cohort, which is particularly important for Aboriginal populations because 5 to 11 year olds are 15% of their population as opposed to 9% of uh, the general population. So it will ensure uh, much more, uh, a much larger chunk of the overall population being covered if we cover um, 5 to 11 year olds. I'll probably stop here. I'm conscious of time. Um, the presentation was a bit all over the place, but I um, just wanted to give an overview of what we've done in the last 20 months and what we're up to. And I'll stop there, Carmen. Thank you.